Hi, this is Rachel from Ray K Books, and I'm going to be interviewing Rachel Kane, who is the icon right now. Hello, Rachel. Hi. <laughs> so we're going to be promoting the Prince of Shadows, which comes out in February. Uh, can you please tell us what Prince of Shadows is about? Sure. Um, I apologize for my lack of camera presence. But as it turns out, Google Hangouts has a problem with new Mac updates. So I am I am I can only be there in an iconic form. So hi, I hope you like my icon. Um, so <laughs> your voice is angelic, so good. I'm so happy. I've worked for years on it, as a matter of fact. Um I I I wanted to tell you a little bit about Prince of Shadows because it's an interesting, weird story. Uh, the book itself is a retelling of Romeo and Juliet in a way because I tried not to change the events of the play uh, and I didn't take it out of the period but I, what I wanted to do was tell the story around the events of the play. So it really is Benvolio's story who is Romeo's cousin and uh, basically what Benvolio knows about all of the situations changes the interpretation of everything that happens. So that's the short version. Very nice, very nice. So my first question is how much research did you do for this book? Ooh, um, you know I did quite a bit and it, when I first got the, uh, got the idea the first thing I did was go grab a copy of the play and read it straight through because my initial idea don't ever let anybody tell you that Twitter being on Twitter is a waste of time because this book would not be here without Twitter uh, I was <laughs> I was on Twitter uh, reading my my you know my my the people I follow and Shannon McGuire uh, who's a, a friend of mine and a great author um, tweeted, I, I need to finish this story about Tybalt. And I thought, Tybalt, Tybalt, what? wow, she's writing this Romeo and Juliet story from Tybalt's point of view. What a great and interesting idea. And it, my mind just took off and raced around with it. And uh, then I thought, well, she's already doing it, so I can't. So I was ready to walk away. And then she tweeted, I mean, of course, Tybalt's my cat. <laughs> So that idea was mine, and I ran away screaming with it. Um, but then as I read the play, I realized, okay, Tybalt, I've kind of forgotten, but Tybalt kind of uh, dies. So he's really not a great choice to base the book on because his story ends rather abruptly. Uh, but Benvolio was a much better choice after I read the play a couple of times. And then uh, from there, I went out and did research on a whole lot of stuff. I, I'm kind of a research nerd. That's not a bad thing, though. No, not at all. Not if you want to get your facts straight. Right, because one of the things I really wanted to do was, was have the cultural attitudes correct and the limitations on what young men and women could do with their lives and how they dealt with those restrictions. Um, so I did a lot of reading, and one of the great books that I read was a, a book called The Murder of a Medici Princess, which really tells you a whole lot about the role of women in that society and the terrible things that can happen when you try to buck the system um, and, and how restrictive it is for the boys as well, so it's not just the girls. But I, I did that, and I, I even went to the extent of trying to find out what a typical meal was like in that kind of household because shock, amazement, tomatoes were not introduced in Italy until the 1700s, so, um, oh, wow. or late 1600s, so, so in, in that period when the play was written there would have been no tomato sauce. Imagine Italy without tomato sauce. Go ahead, I'll wait. <laughs> no, it's, that's really interesting. So with all these little tidbits uh, that you research, you put some of them in your book and some of them don't. So what is the most interesting fact that you have learned um, while writing Prince of Shadows? It's, I think probably the one that surprised me the most because I, I ran my book past a couple of experts, one of whom was a historian who specialized in that period and one was a Shakespearean scholar. 
And from the historian, I got the surprising note that said you can't you can't use the word romance or romantic because really? that word was not in common usage in that way until the 1700s. It's a fairly modern kind of word, and when and they really didn't have a word for what we think of as romance. It would have been amour. It would have been some sort of romantic love, but with a very different kind of spin and component. And uh, and they would have called it a romance a seduction mm -hmm. uh, because it's not the same kind of thing. So I had to go through and rewrite all of these phrase references that I'd made to romance into something else, and it actually helped <laughs> because it gave it an unexpected flavor in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. So is there a message in Prince of Shadows that you want readers to grasp? One of the things that always bothered me when I read Romeo and Juliet, even in, in high school, was that it seemed as if this love literally came out of nowhere between Romeo and Juliet. And it was so destructive, not just to them, but if you look at all of the damage it caused around them, you know, by by the time we're um, to the end of the play, there are several dead people <laughs> yeah. who didn't need to be there. And uh, and and I, it worries me sometimes that we hold up Romeo and Juliet as being such an icon of true love when it was so ultimately destructive. Right. So I wanted to not not totally undermine that, but I wanted to give people a different way to think about it and to see that there might have been downsides to the story that might not be readily apparent. So, in Romeo and Juliet, Romeo and Juliet have insta-love like no other book I have ever read. That's <laughs> they, true. It's like they're in love with each other. <laughs> love at first sight. It's crazy. So, do you believe that that actually exists? I think it can. But I, I, I think that it also, the part of the problem was there was, their love at first sight admitted no reality. So it was more of an obsessive love where no one could tell them anything that made any difference at all. Um, if they told them, if you do this, God will burn the city, they would probably still do it because it was more of an obsession than it was an actual love because love you still care very much for what happens to the other person and it almost was if and in fact it, it's even explicitly stated in the play they don't really care what happens to them as long as they get this short-term goal and it's it's sort of an interesting <laughs> dysfunctional relationship in a way um, so I, that, that's part of why I wanted to write this, because I wanted to explore that a little bit and talk about why were they feeling this way? What made them go so far off the rails in terms of the, how their family viewed them? Right. And so there are in the book a lot of Christian beliefs. A lot mm -hmm. of the church is in this book. Um, do some of those beliefs uh, go into your life as well, or are those beliefs just because you wanted it to be more like that time period? Well, I don't think you can write that period in history without having that be that be a, an overwhelming presence because it wasn't a choice. It was something that was woven into your life in every possible way. Uh, you you wouldn't think of it as being something you only did on Sundays or you only did because everybody else did it. It, it, it was something you were born into and you as much as your city. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't really separate the church from the story because it's woven into the story so deeply. Um, no, I didn't really have a lot of uh, people question how they felt about the church. Um, that period is not notable for that <laughs> until you get a little later on and then you start getting a lot of questioning about the church. But uh, I, I wanted to be really faithful to the period more than anything else. Um, am I that devout? Probably not. <laughs> I, 
I don't think I can. Uh, I don't think I can make that claim. Right. So, getting off into the story, let's go into the cover of the book. Who um, created or designed the cover? The cover was done by the amazing folks at Penguin. Um, it's the art is by a gentleman named Mike Heath, and Mike is amazing. I, I just love his work, and he's done a lot of great covers. Um, this is my first time working with him on a book, so I'm very excited to be one of his new clients. Um, and he's, but the Penguin people really had a vision for this, and I think it's very cool what they did with it. Because trying to put, you know, to, I was trying to figure out how they were going to portray him so they got across all of the themes of the book. And making him a literal shadow on the cover <laughs> was such an interesting and exciting idea for me. And I really loved the way it came out. So we're going to go into some Twitter questions. Yay. One of them is for Jackie. And she said, will the be Will there be, ever be further story arcs based on any characters from the Weather, Warden, or Outcast books? I loved them. Ooh, thank you, Jackie. I appreciate that. Um, the answer is yes, um, but it will probably at this point take the form of novellas and short stories. Um, I'm actually working on putting a novella into the schedule for this year, that's going to be a Weather Warden story. And I'm pretty sure that the Outcast season characters will also be woven into it, too. I haven't gotten extremely detailed in my plotting with it yet, but it's definitely coming this year. So you have some more. How, how many books are you working on at the moment, then? Um, I'm actually being a real slacker by my standards. <laughs> Oh, only three books. <laughs> Generally, I was doing four to five a year for you several, really? years. Yeah, several years. And and part of that while I had a full-time job, so it was crushingly difficult. And I, I'm, I've finished up most of my contracts at this point, and I am sort of preparing for the next series that I'm going to be doing. But um, right now, my expectation is to have two books out this year, not four. So I'm working, working on pre-work on a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the other question is from Ella Bella Boo. That's <laughs> your name. Uh, do you have any idea for a new series or book that you'd like to write? Ooh, yes, I do. And um, in fact... I don't think I'm. I don't think this is spilling too many beans, but there should be an announcement coming next week. I think about a new series, but I can't tell you about it yet because it's not t technically out yet. I mean, the news isn't out yet, but it's coming next week, and it's going to be a three-book series. All right. Very nice. And so now we're going to play a game Ooh. called. Would you rather <laughs> a literature edition? And for those of you who don't know, would you rather? I would ask a question like, would you rather eat apples or oranges for the rest of your life? And Rachel would have to say one or the other. So the first one is, would you rather fight next to Hermione from Harry Potter or Katniss from the Hunger Games series? Ooh, tough choice. See, I would need to know my battle in order to answer that correctly. Um, I'm going to guardedly say Katniss, but only because I don't know if we're actually fighting for our lives. <laughs> so. I think any time. So if you're fighting for our lives, it's going to be one person, but if not, it's going to be the other? Yeah. If we're fighting for, you know, if, if we're fighting in a less immediately lethal contest, I might, I would probably go with Hermione because I think she'd probably win decisively and quickly. <laughs> it's going to be a bloody hand-to-hand -hand struggle. I'm going to go with Katniss. Okay. Would you rather read a book that is written poorly but has an excellent story or read one with weak content but is written well? Ooh, see, this is gonna this is gonna out me here. Is is <laughs> but, but 
I'm going to say option A on that one because I love ideas. And, uh, you know, I I can forgive some some writing shortfalls. Heck, I have a lot of writing shortfalls. But I think that the, a great story can carry you through so brilliantly that you don't notice those things. Um, beautifully written stories that go nowhere, I can't really make it through. So I, I just, I, I've done it, I've done it before where I've picked up a, a beautifully written book and finished it and wished I'd gone on to read the pot boiler thriller that was waiting for me on the shelf. So that's my answer. I'll stick to it. Good answer. Good answer. Uh, okay. Would you rather write novels where all of the characters are women or all men? Ooh. Man, that's tough, too. Um, I, I, I guess if I were going to set it on, you know, an island somewhere, I would probably pick... Oh, so tough. <laughs> um, we ask the hard questions here at Ray K Books. You do. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say women because I think that there's a whole. For one thing, there's going to be not just community, but also a great deal of, of interesting political struggle that maybe is not as obvious on an island of men. So I think there's a little more. I don't know. I don't want to say more depth in that society, but there's going to be more variations in that society, I would think. Right. Plus more drama. Women are really good with drama, too. Oh, <laughs> well, you guys are good with drama. Yeah. We talk about each other behind our backs all the time. That's what we do. Uh, <laughs> no, not all of us, but, you know, mean well, girls. Not me, um, but... Uh, okay, so... Would you uh, rather only write your books in trilogies or standalones? Trilogies. I didn't have a problem with that one. Trilogies. This, Prince of Shadows is the only standalone up book I've written in uh, in the last thirty. Wow. So, well, was it hard for you to do that? Not. And then it wasn't so much because of the. It, no, it was pretty easy because the subject matter told me the link that needed to be or the story I wanted to tell, but generally I spin longer story arcs, so trilogies make a lot more sense, or six books or nine books or good heavens, 15 books, which I am known to commit. Right. Uh, would you rather write a plot twist you hated or write a character you hated? Um, character. Because plot twists never never go away. You can kill a character. You're stuck with the plot twist. Right. Right. If you don't like a character, you can just kill them off like that. Absolutely. In the worst way possible, too. Yeah, and with prejudice. Absolutely. <laughs> right, right. Um, where am I? Okay, there I am. Would you rather be... Uh, would you rather a super successful movie be made from one of your books or a long-lasting television series? I'm going to say television series because I think that, uh, and with rare exceptions, a film is going to do well, but there's a lot of films, and it's hard to become iconic in that, in, in that particular environment. TV shows stand a lot better chance of that, I think, overall. And and plus, I just like television. I like the longer canvas on which you can tell a story. Right. So our last would you rather question is, would you rather critiques rip your book apart publicly or never talk about it at all? Oh, I would rather they rip it apart publicly. Bloodily. Go for it. Assault that book. Uh, you wouldn't like be in tears, be like, oh, they hated my book. I'm not saying I wouldn't feel a little pain from it, but the fact is I also understand that when it leaves my fingers and it goes off into the great world, 
it's something else. It's not. It's no longer something I control. I did my best on it, but it's you know I I'm not going to get angry about it. I'm not going to go out and have Amazon review fights about it. It's you, people always bring their own experience to a re, to reading a book, and their experience is never wrong. Maybe it would be wrong for me, but it's never wrong for them. So I'm fine with people giving you know one star reviews. I'm sure some of them would have given zero stars if they could have. So good for them. Good for them. Yeah. I don't. I don't know. I think if I was an author, I don't think I could handle that. I think that's why I'm not an author. <laughs> Is because if somebody said something like terrible about my baby, I'd just be like, ah, I couldn't deal. Well, you can, you can, you can, uh, you can take a certain amount of it. Now, you know, when it starts getting to be a pile on and there's like a hundred of them, then it's not so much fun. But I, I like I like reading my bad reviews, and I and I pick like one or two one star reviews every couple of months, and I look at them. Because I want to know what people are saying that they didn't like. Because some of it, yeah, okay, I could have done it better, or maybe I might do it differently next time. But if I don't know that they found it difficult or bad or what have you, I won't really understand why people are upset. So I, I think it's better for me to know than not know. Okay, and that concludes our Would You Rather with Rachel and Rachel. Yay! Yay! Okay, so we're going to go to a Twitter question. Penguin Teen Australia. Has Hi, Penguin Teen Australia. Australia. <laughs> I love you. I love you too, Penguin. Um, has the reaction to the ending of Morganville Vampires surprised, delighted, or shocked you? I've been very excited about the way people have received the ending of that series because after 15 books people are very very invested <laughs> if they if they have gone through that much with the characters uh, they have a huge stake in what happens and I was very nervous about the ending uh, but I have not had hardly anyone hate the ending I think I've had maybe one or two people who've been pretty vocal, but it's mainly because they wanted my main character to end up with somebody else. That's that's fair, right. but it wasn't going to happen, and I've said publicly it wasn't going to happen for years, so no, it came out uh, better than I could have hoped, I think, and I get messages every day from people who say how pleased they are with the way the series ended, so it's good for me. So my question is if a fan comes up to you and says, please, please, can a book happen this way? Does that help sway your decision at all? Like if like a group of people are like, please let this person be with this person? Or is your mind made up? Um, my mind is pretty much made up. Not because I'm the god, queen, empress of the universe. But <laughs> because I do what the characters tell me. And, it, you know, if, if as I'm writing the character, I sense that there's something else that would be better for the character, I will go that way. But having somebody explain it to me because that's what they want to see, if the character says, no, not really, then I'm, I'm just not going to listen. And, and it's, it's not that I don't love my readers. I do. But, you know, the characters have to come first because they live in my head and they argue. <laughs> are you are you are you one of those authors where you don't really know what's going to happen, but when you type it, it kind of the story writes itself? I am I'm a weird hybrid writer because I need to have an outline and I need to have that because of my schedule. When you write a book every three months, you better know where you're going, you, you know, because otherwise it'll take too long to explore all the little side paths. So I have an outline, but my outline's very vague <laughs> in places. And that allows me to just kind of discover new things as I go along and chase them down, as long as I can come back to the trail in the end of it. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit of a planner and a pantser, as we like to say. Seated the pants writer is a pantser. So 
I'm I'm strange. Has a book that you've written, you've had a kind of sort of outline, but it turns out the book completely just turns on itself and it's something different than you ever thought it would be? It's gone significantly differently on a couple of occasions, one of which, uh, see, part of the reason that you have to write the outline is that the publisher takes that outline and they do a lot of things with it. It's not just for you. You turn it into the publisher and it's how they start making cover copy, that's how they start making cover design. All of those things happen while you're still working on the book, in, in my case, because of the schedule. So if I significantly change the book and they put cover copy on the book that doesn't match the events of the book, it can be a problem. <laughs> and it has been a problem twice. Um, where there's actually one book that had a character mentioned on the back cover copy that never existed. Oh no! Because I I destroyed them in the draft. <laughs> <laughs> out completely. <laughs> oh no! So how did that turn out? I don't think anybody noticed. Oh good. Okay. Except me. It I've been really off. bad. <laughs> Now, if I'd made a change, like, you know, if, if suddenly the book I said was going to be in the 18, in 1890s London turned out to be in 3007 Mars, I would probably have to tell the, uh, tell the publisher up front about that. Because the cover would be significantly different, I'm guessing. Very true. Very true. Okay, so well, let's do one more Twitter question right now. Um... Gryffindor chick, I'm guessing you like Harry Potter, mm -hmm. uh, says, will there be any more Morganville vampire books? Ooh, I am so sorry, Gryffindor chick. That was the last one, at least for now. And that's because after 15 books, people have had a significant time and money investment in this series. And it's very hard to ask them to keep going with me. And I felt like, also, the characters needed to have a happy ending. Or as happy as you get in Morganville, I should say. And, uh, and a bit of a break. Because in 15 books, they'd actually only aged, I think, two and a half years, maybe three. Wow. So, yeah. I had to let them grow up. And that meant, because if I let them grow up in 15 books... Naturally, they would have been way outside of the young adult spectrum by the well, end. What about um, what about spinoffs? Spinoffs is a possibility, but I, I I needed some time to get distance from the material a little bit to see what that would look like. I'm not ruling it out. I just I don't know that I'm ready to write that yet. Um, what I'm going to be writing next is significantly different again from anything I've done before. So, but still young adult, so we'll see how it goes. Was it hard saying goodbye to those characters? Or were you just like, okay, this is enough, we're good? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I had a hard time, you know. I, I actually, when I finished the last book, I thought, wow, I, I just, I didn't really want to hit send on that, on that manuscript. Because I, I have enjoyed that so much. I mean, I started that series in 2006. Or actually, 2005 was when I wrote the first book. So it's been a significant portion of my life. And it was, it was not easy to let go. But I felt like it was the right time to do it. So, well, okay, I'm doing another Twitter question. <laughs> They're just so fun. Um, Caitlin says... When will you announce casting for the at MV the series? It's going to be a series. Yeah. Oh my God. We're we're doing <laughs> we're doing a uh, we did a Kickstarter in June into July of last year, mm -hmm. and we raised the money. And the reason that we've been delayed a little bit is that we were in some talks to enter into an agreement with another producing partner whom I cannot name at this point, but it's it's really cool. And so we wanted to get that done, and now we, because of the fact that we've basically increased our budget and we have a lot more to work with, 
we had to go back and redo scripts. So now we're getting to the point where we're about to start the casting process. I will be giving you guys more details about that in the next two, I'm, I'm going to say for safety three weeks, but I think it's more likely two weeks, but don't hold me to it. So once you get it um, like filmed and stuff, are you going to like put this to a what is it called like a television station? Like I don't, I don't know what it's called. I forgot, but like a, a pilot. Yes, thank you, a pilot. Yeah, well, it it certainly is gonna it's gonna end up being able to be that. It's gonna have a lot of uses for for different things. Um, this the way that it's planned right now is it's going to be. Like watching a TV show um, on Netflix, uh, often the episodes are shorter, mm -hmm. and then they, you know, you can watch a whole season in like an hour, maybe an hour and fifteen minutes, and that's what we're shooting for: is a whole season in an hour and something. And uh, it'll also be available on DVD, and we can use it as a pilot for networks to look at. So it's going to have a lot of uses and it's going to be, I think, super cool because we're having a blast. So if fans want to be a part of it, like maybe try out for a part, can they do that? Or are you going to go to like an acting website or how are you going to get the actors? We're going to have, re I mean, this is a real deal kind of thing. And so we're going to have a casting director, we're going to have professional crew, we're going to have everything, but we're talking about how best to allow some fan participation for parts. It's logistically huge because of the worldwide participation that we think we're going to get. So we're looking at different ways to do that and that's part of why it's going to take a little time to get it all organized because we want to be able to answer all the questions at once. But yeah, definitely I think it would be great to be able to do that and we've actually had those conversations. Okay. So, if you were to pick any actor out there to play your characters, who would you pick? Ooh, well, you know, there's so many, and and I try not to pick the the main young adult part simply because um, whoever I pick is generally somebody I just saw in a show, and obviously <laughs> <laughs> a little short term memory there. <laughs> Well, or else they're too, you know, they're aging out of the part already because the young adult parts are so specific. But, um, I, and obviously if I've seen them in the show, they're probably working. <laughs> so that's a little hard. Um, I, 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 I'm safe for on the adult parts, the, the more mature parts, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if I had to pick a dream person, I would say, David Tennant, please come be my Mernon, but that's <laughs> not going to happen. <laughs> Crossing my fingers for you, you never know. Surely he's logged on to this chat right now. <laughs> he's a secret admirer, of course. Of course. I, I, I walked past his, his apartment building once in London, so I know, I, I, you know, well, well, probably he's not there anymore, because he probably knows I walked past there. <laughs> Okay, so on to another game, the last game we have. Okay. And it's called Fill in the Blank, which is exactly how it sounds, except I'm going to say a part of a sentence, and then I'm going to say blank, and you have to say the first word that pops into your head. So if you think, like, cheese at that moment, you have to say cheese. <laughs> okay. That's the fun of it. So let's get started. When I first sit down to write, I blank. Have coffee. When I write, I have to have blank. Coffee. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> we may have a theme here. <laughs> That's okay. It's the first word that comes to your head. When creating a new character, I want them to have blank. Ooh, uh, spirit. All great mysteries have to have blank. Murder? <laughs> That's terrible. Yes, every single murder miss. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, when I read a bad review of my book, I blink. Treasure it. Aww. 
Don't everybody write one now. Everybody write a horrible review so she can treasure it. Um, <laughs> but I treasure the others so much more. Yes, <laughs> so true. Um, I don't like a book when it has blank. A bad ending. Oh, I totally agree with you. I can't deal with it. When it's like a really good book and then the ending is just like, pfft, your yeah. spirit's lower. True. Um, my character reaches out of the pages, takes my hand, and I blank. Freak out. <laughs> Wouldn't you? Yes. <laughs> I just had this exactly what I said. You know, of this hand coming out of the screen. <laughs> It was terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, one author, one author said, "I take it," and I'm like, "Ah, oh, I, I would freak. I would probably scream." <laughs> uh, you and I have clearly seen the same movies. <laughs> yeah, right. <sighs> so that ends our game of fill in the blank. Good so game. We're so short. <laughs> um, okay, so I'll get in some other questions. Oh, I have a special announcement. Oh, I like announcements. Say it. Okay, so the thing I was hinting around at yesterday or today was I have my first official IMDb page listing. And it's not for Morganville, which is amazing because that's actually, you know, the thing that we've been talking about. This is for a, a movie that is called Exile, and it's a, from a book that I did ooh, geez, 15, 18 years ago, I guess. It's been a long time, and, uh, and it, got, it got optioned for film, and we have a director, and it's all just kind of happening, and I'm so, so excited. Oh, my God, congratulations! Thank you, and, and, and I wrote the screenplay, so I'm really super excited. Oh, my gosh, so when are they going to, like, do like actors or something like that. Like when, are, I, when is shit gonna happen? Get real, it's man. Happen soon. Um, I'm hoping. I'm hoping that we're going to be casting in the next three months. Um, it's it's coming pretty quickly actually because we've been talking and talking about this for years, and suddenly we have you know actual deals and actual directors and things are actually moving. So. Um, I have, you know, I have faith it's going to get done, and we're going to have a great cast, and it's going to be super fun. That is so amazing. I, I'm so happy for you. Seriously, that's so. It's, ah, <laughs> <laughs> so you're like you jumping out, out of your Look on IMDb for Exile 2014. You will see my name as screenwriter, which is in the credits. <laughs> That is exciting. So, if you were to pick any of your books, though, excluding that one, which one would you want to see a movie? As I a movie? would really love to see Ill Wind, which is the first Weather Warden novel, um, be a feature film. And we've talked about it on and off for years. There are a couple of big producers that really like it, and we've had meetings and meetings and talked, but... It's a tough business, so, you know, whether or not it'll ever get done, who knows. But that's what I'd like to see. So we have another Twitter question. How did you come up with such amazing characters in Morganville? Ah, you know, <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. I appreciate that. But um, partly it was, you know, I, I think it's just a matter of, observing the world around you because I find the more I'm around people the more things I pick up about quirks and behavior and patterns of speech and uh, odd things that happen and, and, and it all goes into some little file where I can pull from when I start creating characters but uh, I, I, some of them share traits with some of my friends Although I don't ever put my friends in my books, really. I take pieces of them, maybe their pattern of speech or maybe what they like to wear or, you know, little pieces and put it into a character. They can almost never recognize it, which is kind of funny. Oh, that's what I was going to ask was, do, do they say, hey, I, I wear stuff like that? Or do they even read your books, I guess? Some of them do, do you know? but they almost never 
they, they, if, if I tell them you're in the book, they'll almost always pick the wrong character and say that's <laughs> the book, which is so funny. What do you mean I'm not the main character? What kind of friend are you? <laughs> But I think you're the villain. What do you mean? <laughs> Even better. So, what? And do you have any tips on how to get through writer's block? Because since you write what, like a book, three months, and three months, like, do you ever get writer's block? I do a little bit. I I find that writer's block is one of those things that we all deal with from time to time, and usually it's a function of. One or two things. One is you're just tired. You're just tired from, you know, the overwhelming crush of your work life and your writing life and you just want a vacation, <laughs> which you don't get in writing very much. Um, and that's okay. You know, everybody needs a little mental vacation, but you have to come back and get to work. Um, so my, my, but the other, the other thing that happens to me sometimes is I will hit a wall in a book and it's usually because I have done something that isn't right. I've, I've gone down a rabbit hole, I've made a bad decision, and my subconscious knows it even if I don't. And my subconscious is trying to tell me, hold up, this is going to send you into a, you know, off a cliff within five chapters, try again, and it won't let me go forward. So if I back up, and I do this. I actually cut. I, I back up and I cut the last 20 pages, 30 pages I wrote, and I write them again. Because often that will get me right through where I need to be. And if that doesn't work, then I skip over it and I write the next thing that I know I need to write, and then I go back and I fill it in. So it, it works for you then? You do that continuously whenever you have writer's block? Yeah, and it's not it's not very often simply because I make myself do it even if I don't get much done, even if I just get 500 words, 1000 words done in a day, it's more than I had yesterday. And it's forward motion and that's important. Um the the horrible thing about writers is that at a certain point you don't recognize things like weekends, holidays, birthdays, anniversaries. I, I mean, it's it's a sad state of affairs when we don't know what day it is, but we don't. <laughs> I, I, people say, "Don't you take days off?" And I look at them like, you know, they they speak they've spoken in a foreign tongue, because that's just not the way it works in my head. So, where can you see yourself in five years? Well, I'd like to be a middle manager in a large international company with you know, over the accounting department. No, wait, that was the last interview I did. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I really think that I would like to still be writing young adults, and I would also like to be writing adult novels, um, but probably not quite the same kind of adult novels. I'm I'm looking into historical mysteries now and some other things that I'm I'm interested in, um, but not so much of the paranormal. I'm I. It's not that I don't think it's great. It's that I don't know that that's where my head's at right now. So I'm looking for where my inspiration lies, and uh, I still think I'll probably be writing a lot of stuff. It'll just be different things now. So. If you could have been the original author of any book, what would it have been and why? Holly Black, White Cat, <laughs> because it's a brilliant book. It's one of the first books in a long time that I picked up and I read it, and I had to put it down because I said, why did I not think of this. It <laughs> Why didn't I think of this first? <laughs> it blew out all the walls that I had built for, you know, how stories should be done and it reconstructed a whole new palace. And and I I just love her book so much and she's such a craftswoman and um does really intriguing and interesting stories in very different kind of ways. Uh, but yeah, if I could, oh, if I could, you know, go back in time and you know, snake that off of Holly's computer, I still wouldn't do it. But I'd like to try. <laughs> so, if you were stranded on a desert island, 
Which character would you want by your side? Of anyone else's? Or mine? Uh, let's make this a two-part. One of yours and anybody else's. Okay, one of mine. Well, I think the obvious choice, if it's from one of mine, would be Lewis from the Weather Warden series, because if I was on a deserted island, that man's an earth warden, and he could make that place paradise. Plus, he's fun, and he's hot, and it's it would be a great vacation. So, yeah, let's go with Lewis. Um, if it was uh, anybody else's character, you know, I, I am tempted... Very tempted to say Sherlock Holmes, but I know he would drive me insane and I'd probably kill him. <laughs> because I don't have the patience of Watson. But I would just want to sit and listen to him for a while and hope we get rescued within a week. So, well, Okay, so your book is going to be a movie. So, what is your favorite book turned movie? Ooh, um, there are actually quite a number, but um, I guess the my favorite adaptation that I didn't think could be done was Lord of the Rings, because for many years people said you can't make that movie; it's too big, it's too it's too epic, the characters are too strange, and yet Peter Jackson managed to pull it out and make it a fantastic film. Um, but, I, I, you know, there's, there's so many books that have not done so well in adaptations. I think the key really is to pick something that has humanity in it, that has a lot of understandable and, and relatable characters. And sometimes that's hard to do when you're when you're looking at things that are paranormal and fantasy. So the next three questions are about teens. Number one, are you team Edward or Jacob from Twilight? Rachel? Hello? Ra Rachel? We lost her! <laughs> oh no! Rachel, don't leave me! Okay. Ooh, she dropped. She dropped out. Okay, let's see if she can rejoin. Anyway, uh, okay, I guess right now I'll just, while she's rejoining, um, we're going to do a giveaway, and I guess I'll just talk about it now, um, and hopefully she'll come back, and if she doesn't, then that concludes uh, the interview. I apologize, ladies and gents, uh, but the giveaway is The Prince of Shadows by Rachel Kane. She's going to give this away internationally, so... Um, what are you okay? So there's three things you have to do. Actually, one's optional. The first thing, this chat is going to become a YouTube video after I stop the broadcast. And when that happens, you have to subscribe to our channel, Ray K Books. Number two, leave a comment. Are you back? Oh, I'm back. Okay, oh, I was just goodness. telling them about the giveaway. So just Oh, so sorry. <laughs> it's okay. It's it, it's the internet, you know. Glitches happen. That's so right. You throw you that. Win, it's okay. If you want to win the Prince of Shadows, you have to subscribe to our channel, to uh, comment on the video. It's going to be a video. And three, this is optional points. You uh, should follow Rachel Kane on Twitter at Rachel Kane. And if you do follow her, please put that in your comment so I can give you those points. And I'm actually going to give my arc away, and but that's U.S. only. So there's two books, one for international and one for U.S. I guess the international will go with Canada, too. So international slash Canada and one U.S. Um, so, yeah, that's going to happen. But we're almost done with the chat. I'll continue with Rachel. Okay. So 
I, I, you cut out at the part of Team Edward or Jacob. Oh, um, you know, I, I really was kind of Switzerland on that question. I, I, I can't really pick one because I, I felt bad for Jacob because poor, poor dude never really had a chance. <laughs> no, he didn't. I, I guess I'll, I guess I'll, I'll throw my support to Team Jacob just for, you know, yeah, kind of. <laughs> Just, just for moral support. Team Gale or PETA? Ooh, tougher question. Um, I'm going to say Team PETA only because I think PETA was an amazing character who just, you know, was was a, a inspiring to me to, to, to read. And I, I, I just kind of fell in love with him myself, so PETA. And the last one, are you Team Simon or Jace? Ooh, um, Simon's got that whole vampire thing going now, you know, so uh, I, I might have to go Team Simon. <laughs> team, you mean Team Vampire? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, even though, I, even though I threw my support to the werewolves, I kind of have to hedge my bets here and there, so... <laughs> um, no, and I and I like Simon. Simon was funny and 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 charming, and and uh, you know, Jace is awesome, but only so much brooding I can I can really take. Mm -hmm. And then I and then I want the funny guy. Yeah, I agree. I co I'm Team Simon too. High five! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> <laughs> so okay, I guess that concludes our chat. Uh, so thank you so much, Rachel, for joining thank me. Thank and. You, Rachel. Again, ladies and gents that are watching, if you would like to win Prince of Shadows, you have to subscribe to Ray K Books, comment on this video, extra points, follow Rachel Kane, um, and then put that in your comment so I can give you uh, points. Um, but there's one more Twitter question that just came in, so why don't we just end with that? Sure. Uh, so, what is Rachel Kane's all-time favorite book? Ooh, of all time. Um, all time. All time. Okay, oh. this is going to be a very weird and non-traditional answer um, because it's probably the Scarlet Pimpernel. And every there's blank looks in the audience right now, but it's a great action adventure story set in the French Revolution. And um, it, it actually was very popular in the 30s and into the 40s and 50s and was made into a lot of movies. And I still love those stories. They're great romantic adventures in the French Revolution. Well, it's cute. I'm going to have to check those out then. Yeah, I like them. They don't treat, the, you know, apologies to the French because the French don't come off really well in those. Although Chavalon is is hot. Everybody needs to love Shalom. <laughs> okay. So that concludes our chat for real this time. No more Twitter questions. Those are closed. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we're done. <laughs> so uh, I already said the giveaway, but I forgot to tell you guys it ends on the 28th, so a week from now. So get your entries in. That was really bad. I should not have done that. Okay. Uh, so that's it. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Rachel. And have a great rest of the night and week. Thank you all, guys. And thank you, Rachel, for having me. I really appreciate it. Bye-bye. Yes. Bye. -bye. Bye.